The founding of the Cotton College, later known as the Old Seminary in 1815, was a turning point in the cultural history of Kerala. At the beginning of the 19th century, the great spiritual, intellectual, and cultural heritage of India was at a yeah. low end. Kerala too was emerging from a rather dark phase of its history. The situation of the Malangara Church, rooted in the social culture of Kerala, was almost the same. It was at that time the English missionaries came to Kerala, to the kingdom of Travancore. The first generation missionaries were respectful of this ancient apostolic Malangara Church. They offered the mission of Kerala and proposed to assist the church in the field of education. The royal house of Travancore, particularly Queen Gauri Lakshmi Pai and Queen Arvati Pai, two enlightened women of the royal house, were very supportive of the venture. The Malayan Church had already made a public decision in 1809 to start two houses of study both in the north and the south of Kerala. All these initiatives converged in the founding of the College of the Seminary. Behind the whole endeavor was also the singular vision of an enlightened priest monk of the Malakaraya Church, Pidu Brahmat from Kulangara, who traveled to Gordon and became the founder of the Seminary. This was the first public school in Kerala where we had, under then, the system of Gurukula that is, education in the house of the guru or teacher. Teenage students would be sent to a prominent teacher to stay with him as members of his household and receive training for years in Sanskrit language and scriptures, mathematics, literature, and other disciplines. The Indian church also had followed the same pattern for ecclesiastical studies and priestly training. The aspirants would stay in the house of a prominent Malpan, a very learned teacher who would be a married priest, a monk, or a bishop. When the seminary was started, it, was, it seems the founders had the vision of combining the venerable Gurukula system and the college study of modern education as practiced in Oxford and Cambridge. The two systems had a lot of common ground. It was basically a residential system where the students <coughs> lived together, studied together, and trained in spiritual discipline under one teacher. So the tutorial system in England and the Gurugula system in India were focused on the person of the teacher as the role model. The Cordellian College of the Seminary was thus in confluence of three cultures. First, the Malangara Church's culture of oriental spirituality and the author of the liturgical ethos. Second, the Indian Gurugula culture of learning and interpreting the scriptures and practicing religion under the strict discipline of a guru. Third, the learning of English and other languages and courses in the then ordering sciences and humanities in the West. So this was a unique experiment after some 15 years of collaboration between the Malagra Church and the missionaries, conflicts emerged. It was primarily because of the new missionaries who, unlike the predecessors like the great Benjamin Bailey, who sacrificed his life for Kerala, for this seminary and for India, the later missionaries were less respectful of the Indian tradition and of the Malayan churches in the heritage. Coming from the background of European Reformation and Enlightenment, they believed that both the Hindu society and the Malayan church were preached with superstitions and magical practices. Their mission, therefore, was to wipe out those demonic elements from the Malayan church. So they began to propose reforms in the Orthodox liturgy and practices. These attempts 
later created and fortunate immigrants in the severity and the church, as it always happened with all other authoritarian foreign interventions in the affairs of the Malagara church. Thus ended the collaboration between the indigenous Oriental Church of India and the missionaries from the West. It was an experiment that was started in a small scale part of civilization. We should however be acknowledged with the deep gratitude that some of the early missionaries made remarkable contributions to the Malayalam language and culture in terms of lexicals, printing press, and publications. They also brought in the idea of the public school where children that were ready regardless of their caste origin. However, there were missionaries who came to India with the baggage of their cultural superiority and the total ignorance of the great intellectual and spiritual tradition of India as well as that of the Eastern Christian Church. Hence, the inevitable conflict. Now, scanning the future horizon, we may say that in spite of the failures of the old secondary experiment, it still holds our hope for the future of our education. As you enter this courtyard of the seminary, you see on top of the arch gate the mission of the seminary depicted in a vast relief. In the middle is a tree of life that gives refuge to many creatures. On one side of the tree, we see Christ commissioning his disciples to go to all the world and announce the good news, the life-giving gospel, particularly to the poor, the captives, the blind, the oppressed, and so on. On the other side of the tree, Christ is seen healing and giving the light of sight to the blind man. Now, light is the great theme in the gospel of Christ. Enlightenment is a great theme in the whole spiritual tradition of Asia. The seminary is called to combine them creatively in its mission. All academic and pastoral initiatives of this venerable institution need to be guided by this twin motive of life and light. The explosion of science and technology in innumerable new dimensions and the infinite opening of cyber windows to the vast pressure houses of knowledge pose a great challenge to human self-understanding and the future of humanity. We need an education that is inspired and holistic, one that gives meaning and motivation for human persons to create a new world order, love and peace, justice and compassion, and not simply a technocracy. Many who love this place, which is the old seminary, the first ever college in India, raised the status of the university. It may however be superfluous and even ridiculous to create another university on the model of the existing ones in India. In a new concept of the university, the rift between the secular and the spiritual so detrimental to the integrity of the human person and the holders of human culture needs to be healed. The reawakening of the Nalanda University, the ancient reputed Buddhist university in Bihar, raises much hope in many parts of the world precisely because people assume that there will be a new understanding of learning and living, of believing and practicing that will bring out some unique qualities of the human mind when it is fine-tuned to the matrix of God's wider creation. Eastern Orthodox tradition, which never had an aggressive missionary policy, unlike most Western colonial churches, has also a great pressure to unfold. The old seminary, with its 200-year-old delegate, may tend to reimagine the connections between science and salvation, between the secular and the spiritual, for a new education, for a new humanity. Finally, 
We need to project a threefold mission of the sage, scholar, and sage for our students. In the Indian tradition, the equivalent of a sage is Rishi, the epitome of wisdom, the seer who passes through all knowledge, finally to transcend to the transcendent darshana of Vishnu. In the Western academia, it is a scholar in whom all knowledge culminates. In Eastern Christianity, it is a saint who is the paradigm of all that is true, good, and beautiful. The three images need to cut across the cultures and constantly coalesce into one single image and one single source of inspiration. Whether we are ministers of the mysteries of God, as St. Paul would put it, or netizens in a technopolis, this threefold vision of saint, scholar, and saint governs. May this venerable school of lady renew its youth and take wings in the infinite space that the Holy Spirit of God opens to us. Thank you.